Let me start by introducing um, uh, to my right Sandy Chapman, who's here from the University of Texas at Dallas, where she runs the Center for Brain Health. Sandy has a background uh, actually coming into this whole area from speech pathology, but has spent the last many, many years, um, and most recently working with her colleague Jeff Ling to um, develop a series of programs that aren't just about creating evidence, but actually implementing the evidence. And so she's with us to talk about how one actually pushes uh, science into practice. Uh, and we'll hear much more about that from her. And um, to her right is Mike Mersnick, who um, comes at this world from a, a distinguished career as a um, basic neuroscientist, someone who over gosh, can I say this, almost five decades, has been working on neuroplasticity. Uh, and um, we used to say that, you know, if you look up this word in the dictionary, you'd see this person's face. In a sense, that's true for Mike. He has a, probably done more to establish the cellular basis of neuroplasticity and the evidence for that than almost anyone on the planet for that. Received a Kavli Award about... Uh, Five years ago, I think it may be a little bit more than that, but it was one of the, it was one of the really distinguished prizes in neuroscience. So we're just um, honored to have Mike here as a, as a very distinguished scientist who, um, like a few other people in this field, I think has um, shifted from this world of, of highly rigorous molecular cellular studies into uh, the world of uh, clinical implementation and has brought that rigor with him. So in creating or in, in becoming the chief science officer at a company called Posit Science has made it all about um, empirical evidence and uh, doing a huge range of clinical trials to um, make sure that what we would like to think is real could actually be demonstrated uh, through evidence or not. So with that, uh, and maybe just a word about me, because I'll be one of the panelists as well. Um, I'm uh, Tom Insel. I was, um, I, uh, like Mike, a fundamental neuroscientist for most of my career. I spent most of my life sitting at a bench uh, cutting uh, mouse brains or rat brains or vole brains. Uh, worked for many, many years on um, peptides that are pretty well known now, oxytocin and vasopressin. Uh, and left that to become a public servant at the National Institute of Mental Health, where I was director from 2002 to 2015. Left that to run the mental health program at Google Life Sciences, which is now called Verily. And left that to start my own company a few months ago called MindStrong. And I'll say more about that in a moment. So with that as a quick panel introduction, maybe, Mike, can we get you to start us off on what do you think we need to be focused on in this space? Well, uh, let me begin by saying a little bit about uh, where I come from. So I, I, I'm a neuroscientist. Uh, I was trained in sort of a classical way as an integrative neuroscientist. Uh, in initial research, I focused on trying to understand the functional organization of great systems of the brain, sensory systems. And I also led a team that created uh, one of the now commercial cochlear implants. And in the course of working on cochlear implant development, uh, I realized, we quickly realized that cochlear implants work not because the engineering was fabulous, but because the brain is plastic. If you think about cochlear implants, we, we very crudely deliver information in a new form into a different region of the inner ear. It's a little bit like playing Chopin with your, with your fist. And the representation of information is lousy, and people initially describe it as crappy. And, and, uh, and then three or four or five or six or seven months later, they understand everything. And they say that what they understand, what they hear, uh, sounds just like it sounded before they, say, for example, lost their hearing, which is sort of a miracle. You know, it's a miracle of the brain more than it's a miracle of engineering. And we realize that. We realized also when we were looking at the organization of the auditory system that in no way in hell could you really imagine it not to be plastic. It just made no sense if it wasn't plastic, if the brain basically wasn't reorganizing itself to do all of the complex things it must do in fast sound analysis that it does do. And also when you understand that the brain basically, and every one of us, come, you come into the world and you're immersed in 
the, the strange sounds, fast moving sounds of a native language. And by, amazingly, you create an ideal processor for that native language through, na through natural plasticity before you put meaning to anything. And you have this incredible progression of putting all of this complex meaning to it. What a, what a miracle. This is not, again, genetics in play. Of course, they're underlying machinery. But it's progressive plasticity. And, and uh, so I began doing plasticity experiments with my colleagues, uh, you know, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, very aggressively. And we quite quickly came to, to two great conclusions. The first was is that we, we came to understand the rules that govern it. So we realized in, 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 in elucidating those rules, we and others, that we could control plasticity at will. We also realized that plasticity was bidirectional. So I could take any one of you and I could train you in a way that would relatively rapidly turn your hand into a useless claw. Or take any one of you and I could quite rapidly engage you in a way that would refine your capacity to use your hand as a, the, the incredibly valuable exploratory instrument that it is. Plasticity is bidirectional. We know the rules by which you can drive plasticity in a positive or ne negative direction. So I was asked uh, maybe, uh, three years ago to write a chapter for one of these uh, classic books, you know, that old people are asked to write about, uh, you know, what you did in science to inspire young scientists. And they said, well, t describe the most important things you did in science. So I, I said, well, probably the single most important thing I've done in science was to try to understand what changes as you improve in your performance abilities in a brain. So beginning about 10 years ago, I knew, we knew that plasticity was bi bidirectional because we'd done all of these experiments that demonstrated that we could degrade or refine. So I said, well, what isn't positively changed by pro appropriate forms of training? What can't we change? What, what is the dimension of the change that's actually occurring? So working with a young a scientist who's now uh, a professor at the Montreal, in Montreal at the Neurological Institute at McGill, we said, well, what if we just make a long list of things, physical, functional, chemical, S things that are controlled by hundreds of genes. And let's, let's just look at these things in a brain that's near the end of life. And let's see how they differ from the same things in a brain in the prime of life. If I make this long list of things, initially 17, but ultimately we've expanded the list to about 35 things. So you could say almost every dimension you can think of of the physical, functional, uh, in, 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 in chemical brain uh, are, are, are in play. And then we saw how many of these things are different near the end of life and the prime of life? And the answer is they're all different. Not just a little. The brain is going to hell in every way you can imagine <laughs> because actually none of those differences advantage the older brain. In everything you look at, the older brain is slower, less organized, less precise. If things are dying off, you know, it's not good news to be old in, 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 in the brain. And then we ask the critical question, the real, really important question, of how many of these things can be positively impacted by training? And as a second aspect of that question, how complicated would the training have to be? And the simple answer was, everything was positively impacted by training. All, at first 17, ultimately 35 indices. And this didn't just include, so plasticity is not just about wiring, it's about all kinds of things that relate to the, to, to the physical and functional operations of the brain. For example, it's about the vascularization of the brain and the control of blood flow and nutrients in the brain. It's about the immune response in the brain. It's about almost every dimension of the physical dimensions of the machinery of the brain, its cell populations and the complexity of their interconnections and the interconnections in systems and the coordination in systems and the speed of operations at every brain level. On and on, everything is plastic. Everything is plastic. Now if you look at 17 or 35 things, you say everything's plastic. I mean, how many of you need to understand that, that God or Mother Nature designed it to be reversibly plastic? And you say, well, why on earth would, na would, would these natural processes evolve so that everything in your brain is plastic on this scale? And the answer is, is because the brain needs to make adjustments to get the answer right. It's basically controlling changes in it to sustain 
general basic operational stability. And what's varying in brains are the noisiness or the fidelity of processes. Brain comes into the world and it's very noisy, at a very low fidelity. As soon as it can, it's struggling to get the answer right. And it's changing itself on the, function as on the basis of its performance. Now, unfortunately, this is a great deceiver for an older individual. They still generally get the answer right, even while the machinery underneath that is going straight to hell. Okay? So, understanding, uh, just one last thing, and that is that the changes, these reversing changes, are not modest. In an animal model, most of the things that uh, we, you look at are driven all the way back. You can rejuvenate the brain in all of these dimensions, all these things changing together, completely back. Some, in some aspects, you have to train the young animal in the prime of life for, so that they can match or, or, or get back to the level of the trained old animal. Now also, we've, we've done its studies at Posit Science using about 50 different training programs in which we look at different facets of behavioral performance improvement by in, engaging in progressive training. And we've looked at that training as a function of age. So first of all, just as in animals and humans, you, your performance is poor decade by decade. You're going to, going to blazes as you get older and older on the statistical average. But when you train, everybody improves. And if you pay attention to, to training the modulatory control system of the brain, the improvement is about equivalent. There's a rumor that old brains can't be changed at the same level young ones. It's a rumor. What's critical is that you need to engage the, the, the modulatory machinery by training and upregulate it as a precondition to, to drive older brains to change as fast as younger ones. When you do that, they change just as much and just as fast. And now, now you can take in any one of these 50 tasks the performance of the average 65, 75-year-old, and you say, after they're trained, how does it relate to the untrained 25-year-old? In almost all of these tasks, the exception are in listening tasks because older people have deteriorating listening. But in every other dimension, the, un, the trained older individual equals or, 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 or exceeds the performance abilities of the untrained 25-year-old. You train all of the 75-year-olds in, in, the, in the country, and they will be equivalent in their basic operational abilities to the average 25-year-old. So basically, our strategy in, 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 in trying to drive changes in brains to keep people safe and to manage their brain health is simple. Let's, let's, let's provide simple indices of these measures. Like, for example, processing speed is a very simple, measurable index. Or distractor suppression is another very simple index that we think is especially important. If you measure processing speed, you can measure it at different levels. That's also appropriate. You measure distractor suppression. And that provides you with a pretty good simple index of the, of the organic health of the machine inside. Okay, now drive it, engage the brain to drive those indices to the performance level of a 30 or 40 year old and keep it there. Well, that's basically what we're up to. We're up to managing brain health by making simple measurements of the status of it in an individual of any age, driving the brain in a corrective direction, and then keeping it there in a safe position. Or you could say, uh, if you want to go just a little farther, continue to grow it. And try to incorporate things in the lifestyle of the individual so that beyond the time you spend on something doing as silly as working on a computer and progressive brain training, you know, it's a part of the natural life of the individual to keep their brain, to consider their brain, and to monitor it, and to keep themselves in good stead from that point forward. We're entering an era of managed brain health. The final thing I want to say is, you go to the doctor now for your annual physical. And, and the doctor says, how you doing, Joe? And Joe says, I'm doing OK. You've just had your annual brain health exam. <laughs> we got to get over this. We got to get to actual brain medicine. Brain medicine now is, it, it waits for the identification of a catastrophe. 
It's like trying to deal with medical issues when the damn train has run off the track and a train wreck has occurred. That's a stupid way to think about brain health. And that's all I got to say about it for the moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mike, that gives us a really good start, and I think uh, lots more to explore. But let's uh, turn to Sandy, and we'll circle back and have a longer discussion afterwards. Great. Well, I, um, too, have been doing this for a very long time. Um, I got my master's in communication disorders and began to work with individuals uh, and were t that were diagnosed with different things, ADHD or were deaf or had autism, and they were told this is what the highest level you'll be able to achieve. And yet when I began to work with them, I saw they could do so much more than what we were diagnosing and what we were told, both as professionals and medical people. So I got interested. I thought, we know squat about the human brain. So that's why I went back to get my PhD to try to understand cognitive neuroscience. Well, how can we begin to understand what is the potential of this amazing engine inside your brain? Because we really are doing worse by diagnoses rather than more. We never empower someone to be more by diagnosing it. And it stunned me, whether it was dyslexia or deaf children, you know, and it was start early. And so we saw so much potential in individuals getting jobs that were told you'll never be able to work. So I ended up getting a PhD in cognitive neuroscience. And I then through my research studies, I saw again, uh, measures and Dr. Harvey Levin, who's a big neuropsychologist, called me one day and he said, Sandy, we do these studies with kids with brain injury. And you know what? They do really well on our neurocognitive measures that we do. You know, memory, they regain their ability, but they don't make it in life. As we track them, they still are failing in school. They're not getting jobs. I wonder if some of the measures that you've developed, because I actually look at kind of three domains that kind of adds to some of these processing speeds and memory and working memory that look at what is it that makes you kind of a high performer in everyday life. One area that we found that's really important is what we call strategic attention. And what that is is not so much how much do you remember but also, how much are you able to block out? The smartest people in the room that drive corporations are those that have a thousand things to look at, but they know the two to focus on. You know, so being able to sift through information, different parts of your brain select, different parts inhibit. So we have tasks that w they require both of those at the same time, select, inhibit, strategic attention. The, third, the second area that we find not only is very sensitive, uh, to deficits, but also predicts who's going to be able to work in everyday life, is the ability to aggregate knowledge and get boil it down to the essence and then apply it. So that's, what is this information you're taking from the conference? What are the take-home points? And how are you going to use it to change what you're doing? So it's this zoom in, zoom out, zoom deep and wide that we teach people to do. It's complex processing of vast amounts of information, aggregating it very quickly, and then making sense of it. So that's what the human brain loves to do. We excel at. It peaks at about 30, but it's something that we're able to show through our randomized trials can get better and better every decade of your life. When you teach people to do it, and the other thing that Alvaro uh, Fernandez said yesterday was ingenuity. Innovation is the third area we look at. So we've developed measures of looking at how innovative is the mind. We think about innovation in the classroom and little three-year-olds and first graders. And then when you get out of school, innovation, we don't think about. Are you innovative? How much are you innovating every single day? And yet we know the neurochemistry of the brain changes. It loves novel. It loves to be solving something new. But there haven't been any really good ways of measuring that. So those are the three domains that we became interested in. Brain health. It's interesting. We, it, is, it was such a new concept. I started the center in 1999. It was so new that we have a trademark on it. No one was even using the word brain health. And I love what Mike said because still to this day, 
you don't think about our brain and health. We do our heart. Everybody in this room knows what to do about your heart health. We know about to do it for our skin. I say we focus more on our teeth. But our brain is like as if, okay, you're okay? You're fine. Good. I like that. Check up. Why don't we know what brain, because it is complex. And so one of the two things, so we're now starting, so I started the Center for Brain Health. We have 120 scientists. I hope all of you will come visit us uh, in Dallas. We're just a mile from Love Field. Uh, focused on maximizing human cognitive performance. Largely what we're doing is looking at healthy people. Resilience, can you indeed inoculate the brain against decline so that we don't accept decline as part of that we start with teenagers millennials they're desperate for it so it's not wait till you're 60 like we have this idea of like i don't need to worry about it yet when i ask people what do you want to do this well i don't have to worry about it yet you don't need brain health yet what age do you need you because know, we don't even think about it so health but we also do injury and disease we've done bipolar multiple sclerosis a lot in concussion a lot with wounded warriors so you name it brain health matters so what we're doing now we've launched the brain performance institute next door it opens in october which is the translation arm because we're figuring out the scalability that mike's been leading for a while um how do we get this out there the third initiative with Dr. Ling that I was going to share today is something we're calling Brain Health 2027 right now. And the reason we're calling it that is we are going to boldly, audaciously go after showing we can double brain performance in the next 10 years. So to really stop the idea that aging starting in your 20s is acceptable. So the science that we've been doing for 30 years shows that we can change the brain at all levels of health, increase brain blood flow, increase connectivity, increase neural speed, increase the neurotransmitters, increase abstraction, innovation, get people back to job. For me, if I show people's brain change, that's great. But if you're not doing better in everyday life, I don't really care. So some of the measures we're also developing as part of this Brain Health 2027, a brain health marker. And that's not a single marker. It's not going to be one thing. It is a compendium, just like for your heart. You know, you know, cholesterol and everything will be part of that. So it'll be a 15-minute MRI scan. We can get brain blood flow, EEG, pupillary response. There'll be little pieces that we can do. We're looking at cognition, and the, there are those areas that I mentioned, as well as processing speed. How well can you abstract very quickly bottom line messages? How well can you innovate? Psychological health, depression, anxiety, stress. Those things can take its toll on your brain, so that's part of it. Functional real life, what's the complexity of what you're doing? We want people to realize that your brain should be able to continue to tackle the complexity of daily life, make decisions. It's the thing we want most. Why aren't we pushing that instead of thinking, oh, you're 50, you're 60, you're 80, it's too old, and then social cognition. Social cognition, if you ask people would they rather be book smart or able to engage, engage the social network, the ability to have empathy, so I love the oxytocin, relate to people is another big part of what we do, measures, and also changing it through some of the virtual reality programs. Their Brain Health 2027, we have, it's going to be an international effort. We're going to enroll, as part of this initiative, 120,000 people. I hope everybody in this room will sign up to be part of it. We will follow you every year. If you lose ground from the year before, we are going to be coaching you through. These are things you need to do, whether it's cognitively, physical exercise, nutrition, psychological health, getting a job, more friends. So it is this network. We've be already been doing it through research studies. We're now going to do it, and we're starting. We're going to do 20,000 people starting in their teens, 100,000 starting 20s through 100. Um, we have different hubs, so we want to build these brain healthy hubs. Anova is going to be one of them. Uh, Mark Desposito at Berkeley, and we're working with Mike Marsnick's part of it, Henry Monka, Posit Science. It's offering a lot of things. If you have science delivered things, it's going to be part of the offerings. UCLA is part of it, Harvard, Alvaro. Uh, we're also, Ian Robertson is part of it. So it is a massive undertaking that you're going to hear about. 
Uh, and we hope that you will be part of it. Wouldn't it be great to know that your brain and its performance can be better next year, tomorrow, than it is today? And for us to stop letting decline. You know, when we treat different disorders, so the Center for Brain Health truly is uniquely focused on how can we make the brain work better to reason better, make decisions, real life function. So it's an exciting time for us. It was really the brain imaging that changed, because even though I've been doing this for 25 years, it wasn't until we started showing in people 60, 70, very dramatic changes after just 10 hours of training over this three week period of time. And it lasted. So we follow people up to a year afterwards. When they adopt the strategies, they actually get better and better. So it's not a quick fix. It's just like, don't you wish your diet, you could lose weight and be there forever? Gosh, the brain changes moment to moment by how we use it. When people learn to use their brain in a powerful way, they really kind of get addicted to it. So it's an exciting time, and I'm really honored to be on the panel with Mike and Tom, who's changed the way we look at it. And I've quoted him so many times because he said, and, and Jeff Ling actually says this as a neurologist, he said, you know what we're really good at is diagnose, medicate, adios. <laughs> but he said, many people aren't left doing better in life because in some ways we make them handicapped by thinking this is what's wrong with you let's medicate them but add the other things that we know can actually strengthen the brain function physical exercise can actually help the environment but it doesn't always build the connections in the way that we need a brain to concentrate and focus and be a good disorder so it's it's great to be here, and I love this conference, Brain Health, wouldn't it be Brain Health Futures? We have a future because the complexity of the problems we've got to solve can only be solved by this engine inside our heads. It's the most, it's the greatest asset we have, and we can take care of it, and we can lead the world in that area. Great, well thank you, Sandy. It's so interesting, I have saw their slides, uh, and let me tell you, what you've just heard has nothing to do with what was in the slide deck. So <laughs> th this, is, this is so much better. I'm really glad that we, uh, we decided to trash the slides and just talk. Uh, let me just take a few minutes and tell you uh, my perspective on this, which is a little bit different. I've um, uh, been mostly focused on neurodevelopmental disorders, which would include all the, almost all the psychiatric illnesses, uh, more than on aging, although obviously uh, there are issues around depression and trauma and many other things that occur uh, in an aging brain which make it even more complex. But uh, in some sense, the problems that I've been thinking about uh, on the neurodevelopmental side are not that different from what we're challenged with when we think more on neurodegeneration or the, the latter half of life in that we just don't do very well uh, in clinical practice. Um, and Mike, I think, captured it great with his description of what does a brain health exam look like by saying, how you doing? That's, um, that's for those people who actually get in for an exam, which is a actually small percentage. And one of the things that it was so striking um, when I was at NIMH was the epidemiological evidence that actually most people with a mental disorder are not even seeing any of us. They're not getting care of at all. More than 50% of people with a disorder who are really struggling often uh, are not in the care system. Uh, that's not so true for uh, most of the other illnesses that we struggle with in medicine. But those who do get care have usually been uh, suffering for a long period of time. In the case of illnesses like depression and PTSD, the, the mean uh, duration of untreated illness is well over 10 years. And in the case of an illness like uh, schizophrenia, which is very dramatic, um, even in the United States, uh, the data from two years ago is the duration of untreated psychosis is about 74 weeks, which is just sort of extraordinary. These are young people who are um, really dysfunctional uh, and actively psychotic and yet not getting diagnosed, not getting care. So I've been thinking about this for, for quite a few years. Uh, and uh, while um, running the NIMH, we focused a lot on 
uh, genetics and on imaging and on um, those technologies that started to come forward to help us get a much better picture of what these illnesses were all like. And a lot of that uh, really had to do with understanding how the brain was, was developing, how it was changing, how it responded to experience the issues of neuroplasticity for better or for worse, were much of what we were focused on. Uh, and the theme of the Institute during much of that time was that uh, mental disorders are brain disorders, um, whether they occur early in life or late in life. Uh, and what we really needed to understand was um, brain health as, a, as the pathway to mental health. Well, I have to say, I don't think that worked very well. Um, I, I, yeah, I took a lot of your money. I think we were spending about $1.5 billion of taxpayer money every year. Uh, I was there for 13 years, so that's about $20 billion of uh, if your money. Um, and in that time, uh, no change in the suicide rate, no change in the prevalence of any of those illnesses, no reduction in hospitalization. Actually, there was no real change in any measure of morbidity and mortality from this group of illnesses. And I would argue that the same thing is essentially true in the neurodegenerative space as well. If anything, in fact, all the trends are going in the wrong direction, um, no matter how good the technology has gotten and how great the science has become. So, uh, you know, at, when I left, I tried to figure that out. Why did we fail? Why did we fail the public? Why did we fail our patients? Why did we fail ourselves? Uh, and I struggled with this for some time, uh, and there, there, were, there was not a single reason. There were a number of things that I think um, we missed, um, and some of those had to do with the way that care is delivered, the way that we approach the problem, and the fact that so many people who actually end up dying from suicide or who are struggling with these illnesses are people we never see. And I began to think that while there wasn't a single fix for a lot of this, that one of the things that was a real problem, and you've already heard about it from the two other panelists, is that we're not measuring anything well. We don't have the data that we need for people to know what the problem is and for providers to know how they're doing with those people who they do see and how they, who they intervene with. Um, there was a little a mini TED Talk yesterday by Eric Gordon, uh, and the title was something like, We Don't Manage What We Don't Measure, and Everything Else is BS. Um, and that actually, I didn't know that Eric felt that way, but that's exactly where I ended up, realizing that management or that measurement-based care was the thing that we most needed to think about in this space if we're going to change the quality and even the quantity of care. And we needed to come up with a way to measure um, brain function, cognitive function, behavior, mood. That, that mechanism, that, that way of measuring had to be really different than what we've been doing. We thought that we could get away with just making sure that everybody, every primary care doc would give the PHQ-9 to every patient. Uh, and you know, CMS and various plans have tried all sorts of incentives, including paying for every PHQ-9. It just doesn't work. People don't do it. Um, and even though we have rating scales, which are okay, and we have neuropsychological testing, which takes about three to four hours, it doesn't get done. It doesn't get done at scale. What you would need if you really wanted to do this is something that was uh, would use a tool that was out there that was ubiquitous, it would um, be easy, that is, might just collect data passively, would be objective. It could give you a continuous measure, not something that would be episodic when somebody comes to the their primary care doc once every year or maybe once every three years, depending on uh, where they live and what their age is. And the amazing thing is we have that. Every person in this room has that sitting in their pocket or in their pocketbook. There, we all have these cell phones, and the cell phone, the smartphones we use today, uh, are more powerful than the supercomputers of the mid 1990s. It's extraordinary how powerful these are, and they're ubi ubiquitous. There are about uh, 200 million of them currently in use in the United States. There are three billion worldwide. The number is going to six billion within three years. 
that's phenomenal what you could do. So the company that I uh, work at now, MindStrong, was founded uh, actually interestingly by a, um, a computer scientist turned um, uh, surgeon. Um, uh, he went to medical school, got a degree at Stanford, went, became a cardiovascular surgeon, uh, and then became an entrepreneur and ended up in cybersecurity of all places. And his problem was how to track hackers. And what he discovered is that there are signals from not the sensors on the phone, but how you type, how you use the keyboard a field that's now called human computer interaction. Um, he created a field that's called behavioral analytics. Uh, and literally hundreds of millions of dollars are determined in, in litigation for hacking based on behavioral analytics. How you can identify the same individual, whether they're working from the Ukraine, from uh, North Korea, or uh, from some part of South America because of the way they type. Every one of us has a digital fingerprint and it's picked up by the, uh, the, the way in which we scroll, the way in which we um, use the keyboard, uh, which is in subtle ways quite different for every one of us. And what's extraordinary is in the work that he did was to take uh, a few hundred people and do those three to four hour neuropsychological batteries and to follow them with mood batteries and a whole range of other kinds of evaluations that are the gold standard today. Uh, and to figure out which of these features of how they interact with their computer uh, would be related or be correlated with those uh, cognitive measures or affective measures. And extraordinarily, um, the correlations were very, very high. Now, some of that's not surprising, right? So we measure reaction time. That's one of the things that changes as people age. And reaction time is something you could pick up from how you use your phone. That wouldn't be too surprising to any of you. But others are actually a little more counterintuitive. You can pick up aspects of, of executive function, verbal memory, a whole range, virtually the entire range of neurocognitive performance um, is available passively, continuously, ubiquitously, and now objectively. It's pretty interesting. And it changes the way that we begin to measure performance and our cognitive status, mood status. So we're looking at this now. Can we use this to predict uh, relapse and remission in depression? Can we look at it in, as, in people as they age? Uh, it costs almost nothing. It's an app that you put on the phone, and you never know it's there because it's entirely passive. It just works in the background. It essentially collects uh, every time you tap your phone. And on average, we tap our phones about uh, well, people in this room probably over 6,000 times a day, but even for those people who um, are in my age bracket, it would be more like 4,000, and for people under the age of 30, it's about 10,000 times a day. Every one of those taps is a data point for us, and every one of those data points contributes to this mental state. It's a way of measuring how are you doing. Uh, so it's not just getting the answer okay once a year, it's getting information virtually every hour of the day that you're awake and every day of the week and every week of the year. Uh, and we can do this over long, long periods of time. Uh, and it's incredibly informative. Now, this is a, just an example, I think, of how technology is going to begin to change the way we're able to get information. Um, and it's been so interesting to us because when we started into this, we thought we had to validate it by measuring it against the current gold standards. And we've begun to realize that those gold standards are actually not very good. And that what we, we, we can do now is to provide information that's far more related to function, as Sandy was talking about, to what people are doing every day than uh, what any of these laboratory-based gold standard measures would do. And of course, the wonderful thing here is that this is so scalable, because if you have a smartphone, you can be part of this kind of data pool. So um, the only piece I wanted to contribute to this panel uh, before opening this up to broader discussion is that I think there is an opportunity here both for neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative processes to get much deeper data. And as we measure better, we can manage better. Um, that has always been uh, the hope, I think, in um, neuro clinical neuroscience. But it hasn't been a real possibility um, at scale 
and in a continuous way until very recently. But I think now there's every reason to be very optimistic about where we can go. So with that as a quick introduction, um, let, me, let me start with the questions and then we very quickly want to move to uh, taking audience uh, questions as well. But if, you uh, know, I think what you've heard from all three of us is um, the idea that there's a, a real opportunity now to collect enormous amounts of data and Sandy's uh, effort through this Brain Health 2027 uh, I think is, you know, extraordinary. It fits into other things that are going on uh, in various places. Posit, which Mike didn't say much about, has some very large efforts underway as well, uh, in which they're doing both therapeutics but also collecting data. Um, there's uh, things like uh, Mike Weiner's Brain Health Registry that now, as of this week, has 57,000 people registered who have uh, done sort of standard neuropsychological uh, assessments online. Um, there's an Emory Brain Health Project in Atlanta collecting 100,000 people there to look at healthy brain or brain aging. In that case, I think they're up to 17,000 as of last week that have been recruited. There are a number of these projects going on. I guess one thing I'd be interested in is from your perspective, both Mike and Sandy, how does it all come together? I mean, how do we do this in a way that's not just a series of silos, but uh, all of a sudden um, this takes on the kind of spirit of where, where millions of people, because we all have a stake in this, become involved rather than this being a research effort uh, waiting for the next NIH grant uh, that um, can be done um, with 2,000 or 3,000 people at a time. So can I get you to just opine upon that? Uh, sure. Uh, just uh, just say a little bit more about what Tom said about monitoring how people are doing. You know, we take a little bit more of a direct approach with apps on a phone. Uh, we, you could say we, we track how a person is moving in their house. We track how a person is moving across the surface of the earth. We track the number of times they're communicating with another individual. We're trying to record everything we can about their activity. Let's say if they have a history of depression, this cite that as a specific example, because we can measure their social vibrancy. And really what you want to know for somebody that's depressed and you're treating, you want to know whether they're out there again, living a rich and full life. And you can assess that in all kinds of ways with, with, with devices people will carry around with them relatively routinely. So one of the keys, as Tom indicated, is to tie training and, and, and incorporate it as a part of every life, using these resources to monitor what's happening to people in their fates. We're also trying to, as Sandy has suggested, we're trying to adopt strategies in which we can really track people's fates across time. And one, one, of, one of the ways we're trying to do that is to have a person tell us if they can't tell us every so often how they're doing, someone else can tell us how they're doing because we want to ultimately think of every person that is trained as a member of a giant experiment in which as much as we can, we're tracking what they're doing, asking them to help us with that. And we know what they're doing with every stroke on the computer. We want to know everything else they're doing in life, every, to, everything they're willing to tell us. And what we're trying to do is to define the relationship between what they do and what their fates are. Not just in adult populations that they age, but for example in child populations that have a ter terrible early life that we're trying to help have a more normal life. Or in individuals that are at risk for something like schizophrenia onset. You know, Tom says you wait until 74 weeks out. Well, actually you should be about seven years before. And you should be identifying risk and you should be trying to stop it from ever happening. Schizophrenia is probably preventable in the great majority of individuals that, 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 that ultimately develop the condition. Just like dementia is probably preventable in the great majority of people that fall victim to it. Just like Parkinson's disease is probably preventable. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to use assessment strategies, again, you carry it around on your phone, to determine at risk so that 10, 15 years before, let's say Parkinson's disease befalls you, you know that you must do things to drive your brain plastically in a corrective direction. Or given an indication that with a history of depression, you're weak again, 
you should do something. You do something so that relapse is not such a regular part of the picture. And in every way, if you monitored brain health more intelligently by doing appropriate assessments more automatically in these populations at risk, you'd be able to, to drive them to a safer position and keep them there. I think, I think Tom's right. We have to basically incorporate intelligent, relatively efficient assessment in ongoing ways. And also we have to consider what happens to the individuals. We have to be recording that as part of these, this automatized process while we engage them and while we encourage them to change their lifestyle in all kinds of ways that could keep them safer. And another final, final thing I want to say is, is that in a sense, that, you know, if someone like me will feel a strong competition between the other people who are advocating that you do this or that to be better or safer in an older life. So we heard an example of that yesterday in Dr. Rate's talk, in which it seemed that physical exercise just about would do everything for you. You'd be smarter. You know, all of these things would happen in your brain. They only happen through your exercise. That's wrong, by the way. All of those things also happen when you exercise the brain directly. In fact, they happen in a stronger form, and they happen faster, and they're more enduring. So it's somewhat misleading to say that that's the magic that it's purported to be. And the other thing that's missing in that argument is the fact that when you engage the brain and actually correct it, you have major positive impacts in the body. Very understudied. You change the biome. You change the operations of the autonomic nervous system. All kinds of things change in the body for the better. If you're an animal and you train an animal for a month, the month before it's expected to die, at the end of training it doesn't die. And if you train more, it no more and you've trained in the right way, the animal lives 40% longer than it's expected to live because you drive changes in the body that sustain it. One of the things that's going to happen when, we, when Sandy demonstrates that you can drive these performance improvements of brain health is you're going to see dramatic impacts on longevity. You're going to see people not just brain healthy, but people are going to be physically healthy to much older ages in ways that I think will be transformative. So anyway, we have a lot to do. But uh, we, we can see the possibilities in front of us. Oh, I'll say one, I'll just, one last point. It's not about competing for this or that strategy. It's about integrating them. I mean, Sandy's, we want everybody to physically exercise and keep moving around on the surface of the planet. You, don't, you can't engage your brain naturally very effectively if you're not doing that. If you can do that at all, you've got to be out there doing it. Of course we want you to consider issues of nutrition or supplementation. They're brains that desperately need nutri nutritive supplementation. Uh, we, it's all about integrating these. Some people need to be calmed down in meditation. They absolutely, it's absolutely essential. All of these things are valuable to almost any brain. Do them all. That's what you should be doing. You should be doing them all. So if you're not doing them all, get, get off your keister. <laughs> Well, I would say that there's a lot of awareness that has to happen because right now we think about stigma with mental health. I work a lot with people with depression, but guys, every single person here has stigma about their brain. If I said I'm going to do a brain health physical right now, pull out your pencil, you go, whoa, wait a minute, this is early morning, I am in my coffee. People don't, they're like, I'm afraid. I don't know what you'll tell me. We do chemo brain loss. I'm afraid what's going to happen because we still have an outdated notion of that how changeable to empower people. And that's widespread. So we've got to very quickly get that out there. But we want to get it out there. People want, it's not just about measuring, although yes, we all agree, what is it that you measure is important. You've got to have a next step. People don't want to be told, I've got X. Oh, I'm so sorry. There's nothing I can do. I wish we'd seen you. It's like you look where you are 
Don't you want to get more resilient? And Floyd Bloom, that was head of AAAS and Science Magazine, wrote an editorial. He pulled it out because we awarded him the Branch Award several years ago, where he said, people don't take the power within them to do what they can. But I don't think starting young, people get that. And if we can start young, middle school, 20-year-olds, it will transform the way we look at our brain health. And it's got to be through platforms. You can't go into centers, and I agree, once a year. The things that we're doing are these global platforms where you could say, I want to do that, and go in, and I want to be trained. And it's probably going to have to be coached. So the platforms that we are designing through this are going to be globalized around the world so it won't just be you have to come see us in dallas although we'd love for you to but you can get them in rural wherever you are we have to begin to think about what how much are you willing to invest in your brain and how much do you want to keep it going and what are the things that you're doing that are toxic because it's not use it or lose it we are building an adhd brain today by the way we use it. So we're literally, by our technology, figuring out how do you manage to do deeper level thinking and to be innovative. It's going to help your brain to realize what it's like when it doesn't have to be distracted. So brain health, we've got to get the awareness. We've got to have ways to say, when I go in, oh, look, uh, my brain blood flow or my typing speed or my deeper level thinking is better. I wonder if I can ratchet it up with some of the computer games. And then we want them to be able to very actively see every single year that we stop the 65 is the peak of brain. You know, we think of retirement. We're still set. Well, people are living the last half of their life with their brain in a state of decline. Physically, we're much stronger. Brain-wise, everything about it, as he said, goes to pot. We, we can change that, and, and we got to start today. Each person in this room has a sphere to influence. Let's get the information right and get started and work together, not separately. Great. Well, let's, let's begin to open this up. As we do, I just can't help but reflect. I've been reading a lot of uh, from a close friend, Laura Karstensen, if some of you may know her from Stanford. And she's talked a lot about this change at the end of life, um, or at least in the second half of life, but also points out this odd paradox, which we haven't talked about, which is when you ask people about their sense of well-being and happiness, um, emotional well-being, the people who are the happiest are the people at, in the latter third of life. It's very interesting, this kind of interesting paradox. where. You know, maybe Mike's right, and the reason they feel better is because they're so out of it, they don't realize how bad <laughs> things are. But, but, um, but it's worth looking at this because it's, um, it's not all downhill. Um, and in fact, as she would explain it, it's because changes in time horizons, or as she likes to say, you know, people over 50 never go on blind dates. They don't want to waste their time. They're not interested in just exploring and having lots of experience. They're interested in focusing on the things that they know make them happy. And they do that quite successfully. So maybe that's not true over after 85, but certainly after 60 or 65 in that decade or so after for many people, that is the best decade of, of their lives. So for those of you who are younger and not quite where some of us are, it's not all uh, bad news up ahead, um, you, or maybe you just don't know enough to uh, worry about it. <laughs> Bruce, yeah. Uh, two related questions. We'll, we'll repeat the question because I know they're taping this, so. Um. Okay, two related questions. If it's so easy to reverse the changes of aging, why do they happen in the first place so commonly? And then the related question is, when you do reverse, if there are any trade-offs in terms of things when you ex, um, amplify or improve certain functions, are, is there any evidence of compromise of others? Two different questions. And we'll repeat the question. Uh, well, Bruce asked us, as when you eat, why does it go to hell to start with? Why do, why do things deteriorate? Why does it degrade if it's all reversible? And then he, then he asked, well, if you gain an ability, if you intensively improve some capacity, is there any risk of, of a competitive loss of some other ability or some other capacity. So, to, um, well, we've studied uh, 
processes that relate to progression and aging. Uh, uh, for in one way, by saying, can we accelerate these processes in a, in a healthy animal? And can we accelerate aging? And that's a very easy experiment to do. You can take an animal in the prime of life, and you can train it for three or four or five weeks, and its brain looks just like an animal that's about to die. And by the way, it is at high risk for dying a very early death. Now, what do you do? Well, you, you drive the brain in ways that increase the fundamental noisiness, the basic background noise or chatter in the process of the brain. So as noise grows in the processes of the brain, basically the brain struggles to get the answer right. And as it struggles to get the answer right in the face of this noise, what it does is adjust its operational characteristics. It slows down, and it basically opens up its filters, you could say, so that it can much more reliably interpret in complex things that are happening out in the world, so it can, it can understand what they are in a first level. It has to do that. You know, if you're, in, if you're out in conditions where, where conditions are poor, let's say the light's going down in the evening and you're looking out across the meadow, and you see something across the edge of the woods, you say, what, what is that? Well, you have to look longer because the noise, in a sense, the noisiness in the view is, is greater. So the brain has to make adjustments as a function of the ba basic background noisiness of its processes. And it does this beautifully. What the brain is reading is either the level of co local correlation of activity, how, how well it's c controlling its activity moment by moment, or its noisiness. It's reading one of those two things, maybe both of them. And on that basis, it's changing the regulation of all of these genes. That's what it's doing. And, and one of the amazing things, it's, it's, it's changing them all together. You could think of it as having either a clastic phase where everything is going south destructively, or a blastic phase where everything's going north together. There's a switch in there, and we know how to control the switch. Of course, in a real life, it's fluctuating back and forth, and, you know, but ultimately, in the age, normal aging, it's on a downhill slide. Ultimately, you're, it's a loss leader. You're going down, right? But it doesn't have to. Is there a cost, Mike? And is there an unintended yeah. consequence? Yeah, this, yeah. And the answer is, when we first were training children in, 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 in scientific learning, one of my deep questions was, when we train a child in some way that, for example, intensively, it, we engage them intensively to recover their no, more normal language abilities and enable reading, that was, that was the main goal we had. Is there anything else that could be negatively impacted? So basically, I did these studies. I actually did them in adults. I trained adults, and I tried, I found, I, I went, sought out adults, for example, that were artistic or that had some special ability. The architect would be an example and said, can I measurably impact this? I mean, we did this precautiously because I was worried that I would actually negatively impact somebody, or maybe a lot of people, and we could see absolutely no consequence of, of training. But we know, we know that there can be winners and losers for, that come from intense training, and this is a consideration. We know, for example, that I can train you to be an absolute master of your native language to the extent to, of the, uh, that you sacrifice a facility in acquiring a second one, right? It's not that your brain isn't still plastic, it's just that it is so dominant, so heavily used, so heavily practiced that the brain wants to put everything in those slots. And this happens in the brain of a specialist. So there is always some potential for competitive loss if you're good enough yeah. at anything. Just real quick, so because I know there'll be other questions, but we've done different randomized trials where we train people, you know, students or fact-based learning. How can you memorize it, speed it up? We've also done with ADHD some of the computerized programs to pay attention versus our SMART program that teaches them how do you do this strategic thinking, abstraction, zoom in, zoom out, and innovative thinking. And we found that when we teach them to get to memorize, they actually do get better memorizing, but their higher order reasoning gets worse. They're not able to see connected things because they do spend a lot of their mental resources trying to remember that piece of information which tells us why they spit it back out and forget it. And the pay attention concentration, they can sit still, but their learning 
lastingness of learning is shortened. But when we teach them to synthesize and innovate, we actually see a spill down effect to their memory getting better, their working memory, the lastingness of it, as well as abstraction and innovation. So I think there can be some trade-offs depending on how we let them all work together. So it's probably these top-down uh, processing that needs to drive it, but we found improved improvements in depression that we never expected to generalize when the brain gets better, uh, as well as you know some of the generalized functions. So it does matter with how we train them, I think. In the back. Um, my name is Lee King. I'm uh, a director of, a pro of a, an organization called Abilities Network. It's statewide here in Maryland. We work with um, kids who are at risk of abuse and neglect, but we also work with a lot of uh, people with all kinds of disabilities and seniors um, with disabilities and just problems of, of aging without using these really cool techniques, about which I don't really understand how to access. Maybe I'm dumb, but I don't think I am. But um, or maybe everybody else got it, got the memo but me. The one thing I'm taking away still, and I sh I'm sure this will make you very sad, is that exercise can help. Even though I know, it, as you've all said, it's not the only thing that can help. I also had a particular interest in the TMS, and I found out that among the insurances that cover it, Medicaid is not one of them. And a lot of the people that we work with with autism, epilepsy, um, learning disabilities, ADD, whatever, um, have Medicaid. And so I was wondering if you could give me specific things. You talk about how to access things, access what you're doing. But again, all I, I'm, the one concrete thing I'm walking out of here with is exercise more and with the people that we work with. Um, maybe, I, how did they become part of your um, mystery um, accessing <laughs> on, you know, and part of your study, whatever else you're doing? Sandy? If, if I could interrupt for a quick minute, I'm so sorry everyone, to piggyback. Yeah. My daughter, I love your, I love your organization. My daughter has a disability and she's on a waiver. And I've been fighting them for a year and a half to get the exercise programs paid for, and they keep telling me no. Even with doctor's notes and therapist's notes. <laughs> We need you in our world to help our youth as they age and progress to integrate this, this exercise, this important piece to help them. And we as parents and caregivers in organizations don't know how to make it happen for them. Okay, so let's, uh, he, so the question is real world, uh, how does any of this make a difference for people who really need it? Uh, We've implemented the training in the forms that we know drive brains correctly in all the ways I just talked about. It's, it's, a, it's available at a website called Brain HQ, so this is a commercial. I'm commercially involved with this. But I strongly suggest you get, get, get on it and, and enroll. It's not very expensive, and uh, it's relatively easily accessible. And just, just go through those exercises on the program that would be set up for you at the website. And you'd see these cha these changes would occur in your brain. You could say, as as we know, they occur, and you'd be continually measuring your performance improvements as you're as you're following in the path and using Brain HQ. And 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 a good thing to do is to calibrate your performance against other people of your age, and try to reach a performance ability level that translates to you being much younger. So if you're let's say 60 get down to a performance level of someone with, let's say, 30. If you're 80, shoot for 40. You can probably do that and keep, stay, sustain yourself there. Now you can also use that to calibrate yourself with whatever else you're doing. So maybe you are exercising physically or maybe you're uh, trying to eat your way into better health, whatever you're doing. Use this as a strategy, basically, to, to assess yourself, to evaluate yourself, and try to keep yourself in a safe position. So these tools are available. Yeah, and I think you're right. I mean, it's so frustrating when you hear this kind of exciting knowledge, and like I want it today, it typically takes 
way too long, 20 to 40 years, not anymore. We are working with the schools right now, and we would love to be part of Maryland Schools. Jackie Gamino that's speaking at the same time. This program can be implemented. We're figuring out uh, the training with the adults in terms of what's going on. Because of technology and the engagement, the level of where we are, I think that we don't have to wait five years. In the next two years, if you push for it, the things that you're hearing through all of us because of technology and engagement and we get it but we wanted to to know that it works because there still is difficulty there's a schools by so many programs that don't work we have to make sure that we're putting the right things in the hands of the teachers to find out the potential of the human mind and i think we're close so i would say stay tuned but we'd love to be part of your maryland school district and we can do that today yeah. question Yes, uh, thank you for a really interesting panel. Um, on, the, on the topic, and maybe Tom, I can direct this to you, um, on the topic of this kind of very widely distributed assessment in the palm of your hand on your, on your phone, how do you imagine the dissemination of this, assuming that the technology gets good enough and, and uh, it can really be predictive and reliable and all that, um, how does it get out there? So we're actually out of time, so I'm going to be very quick in answering this to say that it's all the the techno the technology is already there. It's uh, and we all have phones. The question of simply adding this particular app that works on either iOS or on the Android uh, platform, um, so it'll be easy to scale. I think the 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 real track the trick for us right now is to get to do the experiments, do the science to demonstrate it's valuable. And maybe this is also in reference to the previous question and much of what we've been talking about today, and I think it's a theme for this meeting, is that we're going from a world in which we've thought of always about how do you get research into practice to now realizing that we can actually bring practice into research, that we ought to be thinking about this in the other direction that there are millions and millions of people, Mike said this very well, you know, people are starting to embrace these treatments. What make these interventions different from previous interventions is that they give us data in real time. So we are learning as we see people implementing the interventions. And that's a very different model than the medical model of using drugs and putting them out there after 15 years of research. This is more like the software model that you you build it, you break something, you build it, you put it out there, and quickly you iterate and learn and get much, much better every month. Uh, and that's the way these tools work. Uh, so it's a very different kind of model in response to the previous question. These are, you know, like Uber, like Airbnb, like Alibaba, like Facebook. These are not going to be in the traditional brick and mortar world that all of us are looking for. If you're waiting for Medicare or waiting for Medicaid to do this, Forget about it. The world is going to move on much more quickly. We learned this with Facebook. You're not, you know, it's not a 10-year cycle. It's a 10-week cycle, and things happen quickly. People will adopt. Things go viral. We've seen recently this year, uh, you know, one particular company with 10 employees, seven cups, has a million users uh, a month, more users for mental health than the entire California state mental health system is employing. So, you know, the brick and mortar era may be coming to an end in a lot of ways, and these kinds of tools are going to change things in a dramatic way. We have to stop. Um, lots more questions, lots more to discuss. We'll be around for a few minutes. Thanks so much for coming, and thanks to the panel. <laughs>